right, what we're going to do today is we're going to um, we're going to shift to talk about writing writing code that will programmatically um, create the objects you need to do some sort of SQL statement and then execute it. That's a little different than what we've done so far. <clears throat> what we've done so far, everything pretty much worked automatically, right? I mean, if you create the, the, the SQL data set uh, correctly and you create the grid view and you wire them together, boom, you didn't write any code. I mean, if you notice in the code behind, I don't think like the last several examples we had, there was anything in the code behind, all right? So um, that's cool, all right? That's cool if you don't have to write code, if the components do it for you. But unfortunately, that's not always going to work. All right, there are times when you do need to write code. And it's always the case, whenever you have a tool or a framework that does something for you, all right, that oftentimes it will do something for you and it will help you get some simple things done in a very, very simple and straightforward way. I mean, that's the job of a framework, right? But most frameworks also provide a way to do it sort of the long way where you are kind of kind of going to go off off track and, and sort of come up and develop your own situation. So most frameworks sort of allow you to do that too. And either one of them is a valid way to do it because the, 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 the good part of a framework and, and when you and by framework I mean like like we've done the past few examples where the ASP.NET controls pretty much do all the work for us. We just set it up and it goes from there. All right. We can also write code to do some of those things. And the good part of using the framework in a very straightforward way is it's usually very simple to do. Right? I mean, if you think about it, to pull up a database table on your page, once you learn how to do that, you know, you could do it in, in 10 minutes probably. All right. Um, the downside, though, is it's going to do it in a certain way. All right, it's going to do it in the way that the framework was sort of set up to do. Now, what if you want to do something a little different than that? And we'll talk more about that uh, in a minute here. All right, um, but what if you want to do something a little bit different than that? Then you kind of have a choice. One option is to sort of tweak the framework. So, okay, um, for example, um, we, haven't we haven't studied deletes yet, but in ASP.NET, when we do the straight out of the box deletion, as soon as you click something, it's gone, <laughs> right? Boom, delete it. Oh. Well, that's not a good idea, right? Typically, we would want to like ask for a confirmation, like, are you sure you want to delete? All right. So <coughs> that's actually a very easy fix. We can add a couple lines of code, and we can implement that functionality. All right. So in that case, it's not worth doing it all yourself and coming up with a custom solution when you can just take the framework and just tweak it a little bit, add a little bit of lines of code in there, and you get the solution that you want. But in some cases, what you want is so different than what the framework naturally does that you're better off saying, forget it, I'm going to write it myself. All right? Yeah, really. The bottom line is, is we want to make sure that we know both ways to do it. We want to make sure that we know the way that we can do it ourselves, and we also want to know the way that the framework works. And in future classes, we're going to study the way the framework works in more details so that we are in a better position to tweak it if, it, if we wanted to do something that we, we uh, um, um, that's a little different than the default behavior. I hope that makes sense. But today is our first uh, uh, first uh, instance of looking at um, writing something that does SQL all on our own as opposed to using the straight out of the box solution. So I'm going to download some code from a previous semester simply because this is tricky code and I don't remember it every time and you don't want to watch me type so I'm just going to copy and paste and then tweak it. Okay. This is the equivalent of like on cooking shows when they're telling you how like teaching you how to make a turkey or something and like they put the turkey in 
like before the commercial, and then when they come back, like the turkey is is perfectly done, and it's brilliant. You know, it's nice golden brown and steaming, and everything's okay. You know, I do sort of the same thing. I have the coat already ready for me, so all I have to do is, uh, uh, you know, bring it in. Anyhow. <clears throat> Oh, well, my voice holds out today. I, 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 my eyes are all watery and my voice is scratchy. I don't know if I'm catching a cold or allergies or probably the most likely scenario is that my cat is poisoning me while I'm asleep. Oh, you laugh, but it's true. Wow. Okay, here's what we're going to start out doing. We're going to start out by doing a login, all right? Because sort of our next topic after we talk about this is to talk about how to maintain the database. In other words, how to do inserts, updates, and deletes, all right? But obviously, if you think of this pizza example, we wouldn't want anyone going in and being able to add stuff to the database, right? You wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want, like, just a link to say, add specialty pizza, it's like, oh, great, I will add a buffalo, chicken, Hawaiian, uh, Mediterranean, uh, veggie pizza to there, and I'll put, like, 64 toppings on it, right? You wouldn't want something like that, right? You want some sort of credentials that, hey, um, you know, um, I'm, a legal, I'm an administrator for this site, and therefore I've logged in, and I can go and add stuff. It's sort of like in Canvas. All right, whereas you guys can add assignments, which I doubt you would do anyhow, but you might delete assignments, right, or whatever, or change assignments to say the, you know, the due date is six years from now or, or whatever. Um, so we're going to talk about, like, maintaining the tables in the pizza database, but we want to make sure only administrators can do that. All right, so we're going to have a log on. Now, the first thing that logon's going to do, if you think about it, is when you log on, there's really only the text boxes, and you click it, and either you're logged on or you're not, right? There's no sort of, uh, what do I want to say? There's no sort of data grid or grid view that's going to get populated. There's no sort of uh, details view that's going to get populated. It's just success or failure when you go to log in. So either you get a message that says that you're logged in or you get a message that says you're not logged in. All right. So in this case, it's a little different. We're going to retrieve data from the database, but we're not really going to display data anywhere. All right. So there's no visual component here. We're simply going to execute behind the scenes a SQL statement, take that result, and do something with it. All right. So that's part one of this. We're going to write a SQL statement that's going to retrieve data and then do something based on whether you're logged in or not. Problem number two with this is when you log into Canvas, for example, you log in at the beginning of a session, you don't have to log in every time you go to a different page. Right? That would be crazy. That would be horrible. You're logged in for a certain period of time until either you log out or you close the window or whatever, all right? <coughs> so obviously, somehow, the server has to remember that you're logged in, all right? This is a different variation of the problem that we talked about a few days ago where we click a link on page one and it takes us to page two and we pass along the query string. Um, a piece of data, all right? Because in both cases, pages that come after the initial page have to remember something that happened on that page. Does that make sense? When we click on a link and go from Hawaiian pizza to all the details about Hawaiian pizza, that second page has to know that we clicked on Hawaiian pizza, not veggie pizza. So what did we do? We passed on the query string. The value. So we remembered it from page one to page two. Logging in is a little bit different than that, right? Because when you log in, you're going to stay logged in and you're going to stay logged in for a while, right? You're going to log in and you're going to stay logged in for a while. You don't want to have to log in on every different 
page. So you don't want to log in and just have page two remember that you're logged in. You want page three and page four and page five and page six. All the pages that you go to, you want to make sure that it knows that you're logged in in case there's something that you can do as an administrator that a regular user can't do. So that's a different sort of remembering data. All right, it's not remember, it's not passing data from one page to another. It's remembering something about the user. All right, and so that's the second thing that we're going to talk about. And that's called uh, sessions and session variables. All right, so we're going to also study session variables. But first, let's do the login piece of this. Yes. Visual Studio. I'll remember to pull down the project or the, the screen. First of all, how are we going to remember who the legal administrators are? Are we going to have hard-coded certain user IDs and passwords as being administrators? Where are we going to put this data that we're going to use to base our decisions on? In the database, all right? So I'm going to go into the, to the uh, pizza database, and I'm going to put, I'm going to create a new table. And that's not what I wanted to do, I don't think. All right, oh, where? I'll tell you. Okay, thank you. Yep. Alright, great. I was just seeing if you guys were paying attention. <laughs> Good right. job. Good job. Alright, I'm going to create a new table. And I'm going to call it user info. I'm not going to call it user because I strongly suspect user is a reserved word. Alright, in other words, it means something in the database. So I'm going to call it user info. And I'm just going to have a couple of fields in here. User info ID, which is an auto number key. <coughs> Bless you. Thank you. Welcome. I'm going to have a username, which is a string. That would be what they used to log in as. So maybe it's admin, or maybe it's like the owner of the pizza shop. Um, you know, uh, Papa John, or whatever. All right. Um, I then I have a password. It's going to be short text. Uh, I'm then going to have the first name. And last name. Now, I'm only going to have administrators in this table. All right? So maybe I should have called it the administrator table, but we'll, we'll stick with user info. If I didn't have only administrators in here, 
if I had, if everyone that was a valid user of the site, in other words, regular users and administrators were in this, I'd probably want to have some sort of administrator flag that said, yes, this person's an administrator, no, this person is not an administrator. Okay? So, um, if you're doing a database like for your project, and you have administrators and regular users, you'd probably have like an administrator flag that was a Boolean that said, yes, they're an administrator, no, they're not. But I'm not going to do that in this case. All right, I'm just going to have, you know, the assumption is, is that um, if you're in this table, you're an administrator. All right, so I think that's good. <clears throat> I will save that. I'm also going to add it so that we know who created a specialty pizza. All right? Just in case, like, let's say there's three administrators, and all of a sudden there's a weird specialty pizza in there. And we say, okay, who created that specialty pizza? That's, that's, that's a horrible idea for a pizza. So we know who did it, right? So I'm going to go and add to the specialty pizza table a column for user info ID. And it is going to be a number because it's going to match up with the with the value in the user info table. All right, what's next? Database tools. I'm going to create the relationship, right? Because go and I'm going to add the user info table. Because as it stands now, it's not a foreign key, right? As it stands now, there's just two tables that coincidentally are called user info ID. Alright? To really make a relationship and to enforce relation or uh, referential integrity, I have to make it a foreign key. And the reason I do that is because I don't want to accidentally put in a specialty pizza that doesn't match up with the user ID. Alright? So, um, I'm going to create that foreign key. So I drag that onto that. Enforce referential integrity, of course. Notice that I put that in there before I started entering any data, right? Because I wouldn't want to have bad data in there and then try to create the foreign key. It will actually not let me, and I'll have to go and clean the data up and then enforce referential integrity. Now, do I want to cascade deletes? All right. Cascade delete would mean it always goes from the parent to the child. It doesn't go the other way around. So what this is asking is if I delete a user, do I want to delete all the specialty pieces that they created? Does that make sense? No, probably not. In other words, let's say Joe was our pizza chef. And uh, Joe created the Hawaiian pizza, and Joe created the buffalo chicken pizza, and Joe created all these wonderful pizzas. Well, Joe retires now, all right? So we delete him out of our database. He's no longer an administrator. Does that mean that we're going to get rid of all his wonderful creations? No, I don't think so. You know, he's given us the recipe. So we're going to continue to make them, all right? So therefore, I'm going to say, no, don't cascade. Because uh, if we cascaded them, if we deleted Joe, we'd delete all of Joe's pieces, all the pieces that Joe created. We probably don't want to do that. Now, students have asked me, and they asked me this semester, but, the, but typically every semester they ask me, or they will, they will ask me one or two questions like, wait a minute, I don't want it to be one to many in this direction. I want it to be one to many in the other direction. How does it automatically know to make it one to many in this direction? Because it's a primary key, exactly. Because this is a primary key in this table, and we're matching up with a field in this table, there can only be one thing with a given primary key. So therefore, whatever primary key is in this table has to point to only one row over here. There can't be like user ID 6 in this table that points to two different users that have user ID 6, right? There's only one person with the user ID 6. So on the end of the primary key, of course it's going to be one. All right? And then the other side, unless we say otherwise, yeah, we could have two rows in the specialty pizza table that were created by Joe. 
All right. Okay, so we've done that now. Right. Now we're going to work on the login screen. All right, to log in. Um, I hope I can remember these things. I'm going to write them on the board because as soon as I close this, I'm going to forget what I called everything. Not a bad idea. Yeah, not a bad idea. Now, we're going to do one more thing before we leave the database. I just remembered. Let's look at the user info table again. What are the prim what are the not primary keys? What are the candidate keys in this table? What's a candidate key? Because the, it, it could be the primary key, but it's not. Exactly. It could be the primary key, you know. So, user info ID is obviously a candidate key, right? Because we made it the primary key. And it's an auto number. And it has all the characteristics of a primary key. What are the characteristics of a primary key? Mm. Unique. Unique? Unique. Doesn't. Well, <laughs> okay. There's one other one. It's required. It's required, right? So, any field that's unique and is required could be a primary key. Do you see any other fields in there that ought to be unique and ought to be required? Username. Username. Username ought to be unique and ought to be required. All right. I don't think we made them unique and required. All right. So therefore, that's a candidate key. So what do we do with candidate keys? Well, we make sure that they're unique and we make sure they're required. So I'm going to go in here and... I'm going to say that, yes, username is required, and it's indexed, and no duplicates are allowed, right? Because I wouldn't want user ID of 1 to be Mike for username, and user ID 2 to be for Mike, all right? Then when you go to log on, which password do you use? Do you use Mike's or do you use Mike's? You know, you don't know. So therefore, I'm going to enforce the rule that the username is unique. I should probably go in and make these other fields required too because it doesn't make sense to have a user without a password. It doesn't make sense to have a user without a first name. It doesn't make sense to have a user without a last name. So I'll make all those required. It's a good idea to enforce these constraints on a database level. Because you only need to get them right at, the, at one place. In other words, if I put in the rule that these fields are required, it doesn't matter if some unskilled programmer forgets to validate them. We create a user registration screen. And maybe someone forgets the validation for first name. It doesn't matter because the database will enforce that constraint. So it doesn't matter what kind of app is application is trying to write to that table. The constraint being built in the database table guarantees that the rules that we've defined are going to be enforced. That's like the gatekeeper. You can't get data in to the database if it doesn't pass the constraints that are built in the database. That's why it's best to build constraints in the database, right? If you build them inside the program, so if I built them inside the program and that was the only place I had them, then if someone has a bug in their program, I could be letting bad data get in. Of course. All right? If I build them in the database, then it doesn't matter. Someone could have a bug in their program, still bad data won't be able to get in. That doesn't mean that we don't validate it, by the way. We still can put validation on the first name and last name and all that. But... If there's a bug with the validation, uh, the, the database constraints will make sure that bad data doesn't get in. All right. So let's go ahead. Since we put the <coughs> no duplicates on the username, do we have to, should we put 
put uh, no duplicates on the password? No, probably not. Okay. Because coincidentally, two people could have the same password. It's unlikely, but it's possible. In other words, you know, look at it this way. Look at it this way. Let's say, let's say there's two users, Mike and Joe. All right. Mike goes in and tries to change his password to password. I get an error saying that, yeah, there's a duplicate password. Guess what? I just figured out Joe's password. All right. Now, again, with two users, that's kind of ridiculous. But still, I know someone's password then. And I could use that potentially to log in as Joe and have a lot of fun, you know, depending on that. So, no, I'm not, I'm not going to enforce that constraint. If coincidentally two people have the same password, then what are you going to do? All right. Um, this might be where I would use a regular expression validator to make sure that the password meets certain criteria. Like the password is at least, you know, eight characters long and so on and so forth. All right, let's build the login screen. And I'm going to start off small and I'm going to go from there. So I'm going to create a new file called web form. Place code in a separate file, yes. Select master page. If I had a master page, I would do that. Add. I'm going to make this guy my start page so that I know when I'm testing this that it's going to go right to that page. Make this text bigger. <coughs> What's going to be on a login screen minimally? There's going to be a, a, a box for the username, a box for the password, and a button to log in. All right. Now, again, keep in mind, this unfortunately is a do as I say, not as I do uh, class. Um, I am going to just make a very bare bones one. I'm not going to spend a lot of time worrying about the appearance. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't worry about the appearance. when a toolbox does that. I don't know any way to fix this other than closing out of it, so that's what I'll do. Open it. Okay, and there's my toolbox on uh, finally. All right, so I'm going to go and I'm going to add. Label, a text box, a label, and another text box, and finally a button. Yeah, that's cool. All right. Remember, the labels are not going to be terribly concerned about what their are or anything is because we're not going to have a pro 
program anything with those, right? Those labels are just always going to say whatever their value is. If I was going to program something with it, I'd probably try to give them a meaningful name. But in the interest of time, I'm just going to call this label have a value of user ID or username, I think we called it. And this one have a value of password. I am going to go and change the name of this from textbox1 to textbox username. Because I am going to use this in programming. And I'm going to use this I'm going to call text password, text box password. Now, this is a password, so it should not show the characters as I'm typing in. No. That is. text mode, I can make it password. So I'm going to go and run this now. Change the button to say log in. And we'll notice that if you type in the field, you won't see the values. So I type in alright does have a neat thing that, that I think started coming about when we had mobile devices where you can press the little thingy and you can see what you've typed in. That's useful for me when I log in like the mobile site simply because um, my fingers are so big and the keyboard so small that it's easy for me to type the wrong thing in. Alright. Okay, now, one thing I forgot to do is I forgot to add someone to the database. So let's go and add someone to the database so that they're a legal user. And I'm going to add a username of Mike. Password, I'm going to make password. Remember this when I'm trying to log on, and I can't remember what I use as password. My first name is Mike. My last name is Zellers. That's right. Okay. Notice that I can't put in another mic. No. Because that column is a unique index. All right. So it is. So I would have to go in and change it to something else. Here comes the code to log in. This is where I go to commercial and I pull the finished turkey out of the oven. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to copy and paste the code from my previous example in. And then I'm going to tweak it. going to tweak a couple of things. I'm going to put a label on the screen that indicates whether they've logged in or not correctly. Eventually we'll get rid of, no, we will we'll always keep this because if they don't log in we want a place to put the air. So I'll call this label, label results. Because I'm giving this one a, a good ID because I want to do some coding with this guy. All right, so let's look at the code. In this code, we are going to create, not by dragging and dropping, but through code, we're going to create all the objects we need to do a database query. 
So, think of what we created to do a database query before. We created a SQL data source. That's what these two lines do. Create a SQL data source. And I call it OBJDS. It's my data source object. When we configure the data source, we have to supply the connection string. We have to supply the credentials to connect to our database. And that's what I am doing here. I'm grabbing the connection string from my web config file. Now, what did I call my connection string? We'll find that in the web config file. We called it pizza connection string. Oh, that's cool. So, I'm going to call this pizza connection string. All right. Next thing we do, again, remember what we did when we configured that. You can almost see, I, I hope you can like close your eyes and imagine and remember the screens we saw. What was the first screen that you got? Select the connection string. What was the second screen you got? Well, you had um, your, your select statement. What's the third screen that you had? The third screen is where you plug the parameters in. All right? And then you were done. And you could actually execute that query then. So, what's our SQL statement? Well, I'm going to want to pull from, and I'm going to want to change this to match up my database here. I want uh, to pull the user info ID. User first name. User last name. From. User info. Where. The username. Equals question mark. And user password equals question mark. So this is my select statement. All right? Select. User info ID. User first name. User last name. From user info. Where username equals question mark. And user password equals question mark. All right? So, yes? For the user info, should that actually be what's on the table? You don't have user first name, it's just first name. Okay, thank that, you. And the user last name should be just that. Thank that you. should be the same, right? Yes, it should. That's why I wrote it down, so I wouldn't get it wrong. I wrote it down, still got it wrong. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, those are the columns from the database. Now, how do we know if someone logs on? Right? How do you know if someone successfully logs in? Someone successfully logs in if both the username and the password match a row in the database. So not just the username. That just says that there is such a user. All right? But you need the username and the password to match the row in the database. And I'm going to grab the user info ID. Again, you sort of always grab the primary key. Right? Because the primary key is so important for everything else. All right? That you always grab the primary key. All right? That's just like a rule. All right? Always grab the primary key. Um, so I'm grabbing the primary key. And I'm going to remember it. All right? And that's what we'll talk about in a minute here, where I'm going to remember it. I'm selecting the things that I want to remember. Because I might want to put a nice message on the, on the scene, uh, on the screen, uh, good morning, Mike Zellers, or good morning, Mike, or good morning, Mr. Zellers, or whatever. So I'm going to grab the name, too. I'm going to grab the first name and the last name, and I'm going to grab the ID, because I'm probably going to need the ID for something, all right? And I might want the first name and last name for something, too. 
and I'm going to grab it for the person whose username and password matches what was entered in. Now, next thing we do is we fill the parameters, right? Just like we did when we developed the screen, all right, when, when we did it on, on the screens. The only thing is I got to get the names right. I think I called this one text box. Where am I at? Text box username, text box, password. So I'm filling in those parameters. I'm adding parameters to this. Remember, in an object oriented world, there's an object for everything. All right? So parameters in a SQL statement. There's a parameter object that you fill up with values. There's a, or actually, there's, yeah, there is a parameter object. There is a, a select command attribute on the object, um, on our data source object, and so on. These next few lines, if I teach this class for 100 years, I'll never remember them. That's why I copy and paste them. What this is doing is this is actually going ahead and executing the SQLs, executing the query. Now, how many rows can I get from a SQL query, from any SQL query? How many rows could I potentially get from any SQL query? I could get I could get a bunch of them, right? So from from any given select statement, I'm likely I could get multiple rows. All right. For this select statement, how many rows am I going to get? How many people are going? How many people at most are going to match by username and password that I've typed in? One. Right. Well, I always get one. What if I put in a wrong username and password? I'll get zero, okay? So, I know that this SQL select statement is either going to return one thing or no things. All right? I know that by definition. Username <coughs> is a unique field. <coughs> Therefore, at most, I'll have one person that matches a given username. It's possible I'll have none. What if I type in some name that doesn't exist in the database? then I won't have any. So, these objects are set up to handle more than one, right? Because these objects are set up to handle any select statement. And select statements can return zero, they can return one, they can return a million rows. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the first row that it returned. Either that will succeed or it will fail. If I try to grab the first row and it succeeds, what does that mean? If there is a first row in my query results, what does that mean? Hmm. The first row is the one you right. the user ID for? Yeah. If, if any data is returned by this query, if I return one row, that means we have a winner. All right, we have a username and password that matches what I've typed in. So if I read data from the results and there's some data there, that means that that's the correct person. We log them in. If there is no data, if I try to read the data, if I try to read the first row that was returned by this query and there is no first row, what does that mean? That means there was not a match. So, I try to read the data. All right? If it's there, there's a successful logon. And I can store, and, and then what the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to store
I'm going to store the user info name, the first name, and the last name in what's called a session variable. I got 0, 1, and 2. What do you suppose that corresponds to? The 0th field, field 1, and field 2. That's not right. All right. So I read the data. I have data or I don't have data. If I have data, there's a successful login. Yes. Even though right in the middle of the first name. Yeah. So if I have data, then it's a successful login. And I remember these values for later use. We're not going to talk about session variables right this minute. Probably in a few minutes we'll talk about them. But suffice it to say that a session variable is how I can remember from page to page to page who the person that logged in was. Okay, so I'm remembering that. My data zero simply means the first data field that I asked for. First data field I asked for. My data one is this second field I asked for. My data two is the third field. Then, I'm going to do something. Now, in this case, all I'm going to do is I'm going to display in my label I'm going to display the string successful. Again, I'm going to display unsuccessful. Okay. Let's run it to make sure it works. Then let's let's go into debug mode. Right? Right. Debug mode will be a good way for us to follow along and see exactly what it's doing. So besides using it for debugging, we can use it to sort of understand this in a better on a better level. So I'm gonna run this. Okay. And username Mike. Password uh, password password. Okay. Log in. Let's see what this does. Successful. Yay. I worried for a second because it took a second to come up. It was it was keeping me in suspense. Now I type in something bogus. Unsuccessful. Okay. Let's go in and put breakpoints in here so we can follow it. Alright, so there's a breakpoint there. What's the breakpoint mean? It means when the code hits that, it's going to halt, stop the presses. It's going to go into this mode, and we can actually watch step by step the code that gets executed. So I'm going to go log in, and I'm going to type in the correct information. Mike and password. I'll log in. Okay. It worked, all right. It, it worked so far. It, it is in the is in the, the code. Uh, so I'm going to step into each one of these, which is F11. So nothing really exciting is happening here, other than it is creating the database objects. So you sort of have to trust that I've done this correctly, all right. Select command equals select user info ID, first name, last name, user info. I grab the parameters. Well, I put my mouse over that. It's grabbing the value of Mike, and it's putting it in parameter 1. 
It's grabbing password and putting it in parameter two. I'm getting ready to do a read. I access the data. Now here's the part that I want to see. I'm reading from the list of results. That's what this says. My data equals the results of this query. You can think of this as being uh, uh, essentially a, a list of arrays. All right. There's as many rows in this list, there's as many items in the list as there are rows that were retrieved from the database. There's as many columns as the columns that I included in my select statement. So in this case, there's three. So this list has as many rows as there are in the database. In this case, one. All right. There's as many columns as there are columns that I selected. I selected three, so there's three. I'm reading data from the data uh, source. As you can tell, by the way that if statement is written, my data.read is a Boolean, right? Because I don't say, I just say my data.read. An if statement needs a Boolean. Therefore, that's a Boolean. So it's going to return a true or false. It's going to return a true if it finds data. If, the, if, the, if there's something there in the next row to read. So yes, in this case, there's data. So it's going to return true. If there's no data, it's going to return false. So in another scenario where I was retrieving multiple rows, I would probably have this code in a loop to loop through. All right, and look at each row, in which case it would loop through, it would grab the next row, see if there was something there, if there was something there, do something, otherwise do nothing. Then I'd grab the next row, and I'd do that until no more data left. But again, in this example, I know that there's only going to be one row, so I don't need a loop. I just go see if there's any data retrieved. If there's data retrieved, this will return a true. If there's no data retrieved, this will return a false. So in this case, there is a row <coughs> that has a username of Mike and a password of Zellers. Therefore, it retrieves data. And I can see that here because it follows the true part of the if statement. Boom, boom, boom. And it returns successful. Let's go type in garbage now. And the same thing's going to happen, and we'll just look at the if statement, because that's really the thing that I want to focus on. I have no idea what that means, so I'll say no. <laughs> All right, boom, 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 setting up the objects, and the parameters of the SQL, getting ready. It, okay, it executed the query. Now, this read. It's going to go and read it. Is it going to find anything? No. Therefore, it's not going to return, return true. It's going to return false. So, boom. There was no first row. Therefore, it's false. Therefore, boom, boom, boom. Set the label to unsuccessful. And there you go. Yeah. Oops. There you go. Unsuccessful. Questions about this? Um, so, yeah, go ahead. The, my data, uh -huh. just the, where it says my data, is that something that you set up? Or no. This is something that .NET has? Yeah, that's part of the .NET framework. In other words, this my data is a iData reader object. All right? Essentially what happens is when we execute this code that says this actually is the code that executes the query. All right? We are giving the results back to this object that's called an iData reader. Essentially, this object is like an Excel spreadsheet. All right? Where there will be as many rows in it as rows retrieved. 
So if it retrieved one row, there'll be one row in that data reader object. If there's five rows retrieved, there'll be five rows in there. There'll be as many columns as there were columns that we selected in the select statement. This object has functions on it. One of the functions is read. It assumes that you start off at the beginning of the data source. So if I say my data read, it means read the next thing. So the first time you do it, the next thing is the first thing. So it looks for the first thing in that data set. And it's either there's something there or there's nothing there. Again, if this was another kind of query where we could retrieve multiple rows, we would loop through this and do a read each time to get the next row and the next row and the next row. All right? This is where it almost would have been good if, if you guys uh, programmed like COBOL with sequential reads back in the old days. Because that's effectively what we're doing here is sequential reads where we're grabbing things just going down a list of things. All right? Um, but again, each read grabs the next thing until there's no more things to be, to be had. And at that point, it's going to return a false. So that is a function as, as part of that class. All right. I want to look closer at these lines. My data sub zero is what? Well, the first column. Remember I said there's as many columns as this grabs it a row at a time, and each row contains as many columns as we selected. So this grabs row zero or column zero, which is user info ID. Column one is this, column two is that. And I stuff them in a session variable. All right? <coughs> This is where we're going to take a break from coding and talk about browser sessions. Okay. You go into Canvas, let's say. Let's say you're in the library and you go into Canvas, all right, and you log on. Um, you get hungry and you decide to go and, <laughs> yeah, I know, this, I could see this happening for me. I don't know about any one of you. I'm going to log in and grade. Oh, I come to think I need a piece of pizza. All right. So I log in. I go to the cafeteria. The cafeteria is having a slow day, which they sometimes have. All right. So I'm waiting in line for a long time to get to, to pay for my pizza. Meanwhile, my machine is logged into Canvas. What's the problem with that scenario? Well, anyone could come in and not just log in, but you're already logged in, right? They could come and they could have a lot of fun. They could send your professors nasty emails, and they could submit garbage for assignments, and all sorts of things bad could happen, all right? So, again, that's sort of a far-fetched example, but what would you want to have happen? Well, if you were smart, you would log off, right, before you went. Um, let's say that you forgot to log off, though. What would you want to have happen? Revenge. <laughs> okay, yes, you would want revenge. But let's say before that point, what would you want the web server to do? Session expire. Yeah, you'd want the web server eventually to figure out that you went to get a piece of pizza or whatever. And... Therefore, you want it to log you out, right? After how long? After how long would you want it to log you out? A couple minutes. Yeah. It really depends on the exact situation. It really depends on the application and the situation and all that. Now, again, I sort of painted a worst-case scenario of, of doing it in a library, which is a very public place. But ideally... After a certain amount of time of inactivity, you'd want it to log you out automatically. All right? Now, if you think about it, even within Canvas, that might be a little different. All right? Um, because what if you're taking a quiz and you're thinking about a problem? Well, you might think about a problem for 10 minutes before you enter your answer. All right? So you don't want it too short, 
Because you don't want the inconvenience and the difficulty of like logging people out when all they were doing is thinking about stuff. Oh, I used to, I used to, our old email system here, I would log in and get an email that got me all, all fired up, all right? And I was going to tell them in my response. So I'm typing in all caps, of course, and a six exclamation points at the end of every sentence. And I'm going on for paragraph after paragraph after paragraph. And it's taken me a long time to do this because I need a break. I need to go and, and get coffee to, to get myself even more fired up, right? So I come back, hit submit, and guess what happened? The session expired, all right? So I actually got used to that and started copying and pasting stuff into a text file so it would still be there. But as you can imagine, that would be frustrating. On the other hand, if it didn't time out at all, you'd run the risk of staying logged on and having someone possibly doing something, um, you know, um, you know, uh, using your credentials to do something that they should. There's another side of this coin from the server's perspective. Every session that the web server that's active on the web server takes resources, right? So it's not just to protect you, but if you log on and you go away for, say, 20 minutes, all right, that might be a reasonable amount of time to assume that you're gone and log you off. Maybe even shorter, all right? You wouldn't want to make it too short because that would be a pain to log people off after just a minute of inactivity. Maybe you got a phone call, right? On the other hand, you wouldn't want to make the session eight hours because, again, that exposes the person to possibly someone coming up and using their computer. And secondly, then the server has to remember about that person and keep resources for that person for eight hours, all right? So hopefully the designers and the, the administrators of the website find a happy medium. Long enough so it doesn't accidentally log people out, but short enough so that you're not exposing them to any risk and the server can release those resources. That's what a session is. When you go to a website, a session is created. And it's possible to, set, to store information about you during that session. And one of the things that would be stored about you in a session would be for a website where you logged in would be your credentials to make sure that you are a user, who you are, and so on and so forth. All right? That way you don't have to log into every page. It can check to see if you're logged in. If you're logged in, fine. If you're not logged in, then ask you to log in. All right? So that's what sessions are. Session variables extend from page to page to page. You can set a session variable in this way. You can use a session variable on any page. So I could put code in my page to display, hello, Mike, because I remember that I am Mike. All right? So let's go and do that. Let's put code in... Let's put code in the list page that says, hello, Mike. Okay. I'm going to put a label on this page. When the page loads, I'm going to say label name.text equals session first name. It doesn't allow me to do that. Well, so we go back to the turkey. Uh, 
two strain. I should have known that. Bless you. You're welcome. Remember that we, well, we haven't talked about this, so how can you remember it? You can put in a session variable anything. All right? You can put in a session variable. We just put strings in a session variable, right? So that's, that's why I was confused, because I was thinking, well, there's only strings in here. All right? But no, you can really put anything in a session variable. You can even put an object in a session variable. Um, if you put an object in a session variable, though, that is definitely a, a drain on the resources. So you want to be very careful. You know, be very careful about what you store in a session variable. So now, if I log in, I log in. Uh -oh. Successfully, if I go to that page, it'll remember who I am. It says Mike up there. All right. Now I can go anywhere in this app. I don't, know, I don't have that many pages, but I could navigate to any of these pages. And I could go back to that page. And it still remembers who I am. Okay? And if you notice, I feel like a magician. Nothing on my sleeves, nothing on the query string to pass it. It remembers as part of the session. Now, that's all well and good. We can, we can say hi, Mike, and so on. But the real power comes in when we can, when there's certain things that only certain people can do. All right? So, for example, on this website, you have to be a valid user to go and change something or to edit something or to add a new specialty pizza. All right? That's what we'll do next time. We'll look at the code to do that. All right? What if I want to add a new specialty pizza? All right? We'll actually look at it. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, look, we'll look at that and we'll look at um, maybe like if you're adding a new topping as well. All right? Um, to make sure that you are a uh, valid user before you can actually add anything to the database. The big things I want you to get from this class, number one, the code to, um, the code to uh, go and execute a SQL statement based on your code and not just based on setting up the classes or setting up the objects and configuring them. The other thing is sort of get an idea of what session variables are and how they work. By the way, um, if you remember back, I said that if you were smart, before you went to get your slice of pizza, you would have logged off. Right? What do you think log off does? What does log off do? Uh, clears the session. It tells the server, hey, you don't need to worry about this guy anymore. They're logged off. So all the resources that were kept on the server about your browser session go away. So the server's happy, all right, because it doesn't have to worry about that. And you're happy because you're no longer vulnerable to people uh, maybe logging in on your account doing something that they shouldn't. If you notice, a lot of sites will say that. When you are done, please remember to log out. Why do you think that is? Well, they're being nice and they're reminding you so that you know someone doesn't come in and use your credentials, but they're also being selfish. They want their server not to have to worry about people after they've gone for the 20 minutes or however long it takes for the session to expire. Okay, I'm gonna go and uh, open the doors to the lab, then I will come back and grab the files, then I'll be back in lab.